Well, hello, Starchy Wars from all over the world. I am Gustavo Tolosa here from Dallas. I'm Dr. McDougall's uh, webinar host, and uh, very exciting. I've had a uh, very good weekend last weekend here in Dallas with a health plant-based conference. And um, uh, today we have a really good topic, a topic that is uh, on almost everybody's mind since uh, heart disease is something that we see daily. And Dr. McDougall is going to talk a little bit about heart disease. All of you got, I hope, the reading material. There was a chapter from Dr. McDougall's uh, book that you're getting for free. And there were, I think, two newsletters. So make sure you read them because a lot of your questions will probably be answered there. How are you um, doing, Dr. McDougall, in California? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. It's, yeah, uh, pretty good. You, know, you, can sure tell, you can sure tell fall is coming. Uh, huh? but, uh, you can sure tell that the fall is coming. You know, the, the days are getting shorter. The um, you know, it's getting cooler outside. Had our first rain this, this week. That was good. Oh, so, good. Uh, yeah. You know, I, uh, the fall to me is, uh, is one of the more, the more difficult times of the year. I don't know how many people feel about it, but I just, you know, summer's over and winter's not quite here yet. And, and uh, I don't know. I guess the exciting part is Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next uh, big yeah, holiday. Yeah, you know, that, we have the, uh, the seven grandkids and all the out trick or treating. Hopefully, Mary and I will get a chance to join them. But uh, yeah, good to be with you. You, you had a nice time in Dallas. I heard the uh, Esselstyns put on a show there. Yeah, yes, yeah, so last weekend. It was a, it was a good conference. And um, uh, Dr. McDougall, I think I told you, would you like for uh, for me to announce to people um, this short little video that I have here? Yeah, you, you had a video that I thought it would be a good way to start out uh, our hour together. It's, uh, as people get to know, know you and our relationship, uh, they have more questions. And I think by you providing this short video, you'll answer some of the questions. So let's, let's hit it. <laughs> right. Well, I think it will be good to also, uh, it'll give people time to log in. This is a two and a half minute. What I'm where, what people will be able to see is that I'm about 50 or 60 pounds over what I'm now. I do have one where I'm like 80 pounds over, but I'm going to show that next week. I have to prepare uh, mentally to show that. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, okay. But just so that you, so, so that people know, this is a little video that one of the hospitals in Dallas made um, because I used to go to a children's hospital and teach piano lessons to the kids to help them uh, with their weekly recovery. And so the hospital liked that very much and made a video, but it's, it's uh, quite a few, maybe five years old or so. Since I have seen firsthand the power that music has, uh, the healing power in many levels, psychological even and physical, um, I wanted to, uh, to do something for the kids. I have a little pony. First, the, the name came almost immediately to my mind, Musical Angels, because, um, well, having children, you know, you see them and, and they really are little angels on, on, on this planet. Very good. To Baylor, we come to our children's house twice a week. One day a week is for the group uh, lessons. Another day a week is when I come and I do the private piano lessons. All the other three. And the, the goal, the idea is to be here at least five days a week. I think that was great for me in your first lesson. <laughs> it helps them have something positive uh, during the day to do. And not only that, but because this program is week by week, uh, they have something to look forward to. So when I open that door and I go to see them and they're all of a sudden there's a big smile and they want to show me. I want to show you what I did this week. That's right, you did it. I got to play the piano with Gustavo and it was very fun. My first time, but it was fun and I want to do it again. Yeah, <laughs> good job. There are a lot of things inside them that uh, we, have, we have all felt it that sometimes we can't find words to express something, maybe gratitude, maybe joy. But through music, we get to a higher level of expression. Very good, you're doing it all by yourself. It also builds their self-esteem. When they get a little song 
and they're struggling with it, but after I show them how to do it and practice it, they master it and they just, you know, I feel so proud of what they've accomplished and then we build on that. Very good. And a few times I've been in the room and having a lesson and a doctor has come in and, and uh, he has said, wow, well, what's that smile? I've never seen that smile on your face, you know? And I'm saying, well, it's because, you know, the power of music. Okay. <laughs>
and uh, reined in a little bit during more honest times. And unfortunately, the food industry has not been caught, has not been reined at all. And they continue this mass murder of people and the planet. And I don't know what's going to stop them. I really don't. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, I won't be on Dr. Oz. Uh, likely, I will not be on uh, any of the uh, big TV shows or media. And so uh, it's, it's just like it always is, folks. You know, it's a, it's a train running along, powered by Mary and John McDougall and Gustavo and Neil Hendricks. And many and, others, yes. You know, many other people, and all of you. I mean, yeah, we are the uh, the engine of the train because nobody else is going to get uh, get along with us because it's really to uh, the disadvantage of those who have the money, not just the food industry, but the sickness business, which profits from pharmaceuticals and the hospitals and so on. For those of you listening to the webinar, you have the information. One of the subjects I keep getting... Uh, uh, reminded us, you know, Gustavo, if we don't tell people enough about how they're supposed to do this, I think it's so obvious to you and I and Mary and many of the listeners out there is uh, this is just so stupid simple. But people don't, uh, somehow or another, they just can't get their minds wrapped around. Uh, I guess it, is, if it appeared at a fast food window with a, a stamp of approval of Dr. John McDougall on it, it might, might work out. Anyway, I was going to get back to, 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 the, to the Oz show. I was going to tell you how Mary came in. She says, well, you need to have me on the show with you. And then they won't be so scared. Because, and she's right. She's such a nice person and, and brings out the best in me and makes me warm and fuzzy. And, and uh, maybe I ought to just send Mary to the Oz show. And uh, she can. So we're going to talk about heart disease today. Right, right. And, I, you know, I have your, um, I, I have your, I'm going to show you, I have your okay. new book. And we have the start solution. Of course, in these two books, you do talk about heart disease, but uh, like you said, maybe we, you could just give us um, an overview and then we can go into questions. And uh, yeah, I, I've, been, I've been, of course, thinking about heart disease for a long time. Uh, I went to start medical school in 19, 1968. And that's about when the first heart surgery was done at Cleveland Clinic, about 1968. And we didn't really have much heart surgery going on until my senior year, I believe. And then when I went to the Queens Medical Center at um, in Honolulu, the Queens Medical Center, heart surgery was a big a big deal. We had a couple heart surgeons there, in fact, uh, probably three of them. There was a guy named uh, Richard Mamiya. And boy, that guy could do heart surgery. He was absolutely amazing. I had a chance to work with him on open heart surgeries on several occasions as an intern. But Richard Mamiya, he would he would get people in there with blocked coronary arteries, and he would turn them out in a matter of uh, hours, and they'd be home in a matter of days. And most of his patients did really well, Richard Mamiya, the uh, heart surgeon from the Queens Medical Center where I worked there. They did, they did really, really good uh, in terms of... Uh, post-operative complications and not dying. Then there was another doctor there, and there's no sense in mentioning his name, but but anyway, he would do heart surgeries maybe twice a month or at most twice a week, and you could just plan on his patients doing terrible. I mean, they, they would die in the intensive care unit. They had post-operative complications, bleeding. Oh, it's just horrible, horrible. And all the residents and all the interns and all the nurses knew that one of when one of so-and-so's patients was going to show up, you were in for a real battle, uh, as opposed to Richard Mamiya, whose patients did really well. Well, anyway, that, that, there, there's one good lesson for you folks. Uh, when you have something done, a surgery, any kind of procedure, you want to go to the guy or gal who does them all day long. You know, that's all, that's all they know how to do, is to, is to get you in, get you out, get you fixed, get your knee fixed, get your hip fixed. Uh, get your plastic surgery done. That's that's all they do, and they're experts at it. You know, I've seen this over and over again. So I started in about, oh, uh, well, probably working with heart surgeries as my job. I started in uh, uh, 1973 when I went to Honolulu and been working with heart patients. And I'll tell you, diet was never mentioned uh, even today. Here, this was a 19. 1973, and you do the math, it's been a long time since then. Uh, same thing's going on now as it was then. Uh, they take the patient in for open heart bypass surgery. They 
slit open their uh, their chest, uh, uh, break the sternum, pull it open, and go in there and uh, fix the clogged arteries, which they had determined previously by an angiogram. Uh, they've identified the, the arteries, the blockages, the closures. <clears throat> And then they go in there and they stop the heart by injecting a cold potassium solution. And at the same time, they connect the person to a heart lung machine, a bypass machine, a pump, whatever you want to call it. And that takes over to the function of the heart when it's stopped. And then the surgeons go on and they uh, take uh, vessels from other parts of the body. They can take arteries, say from the chest or the wrist, or they can take uh, veins from the legs. That's commonly done most of the time. It has been, I don't know what they're doing exactly these days, but it's been taking a vein and putting a bypass around the blockage. And it all makes sense. It all makes perfectly good sense uh, until you understand the disease. Uh, the heart surgery, there have been three major tests looking at a heart surgery, and all three tests uh, show that its benefits are extremely limited, if present at all. And those of you who have been kind of following my message, you understand why, and that is that the the blockages that they bypass are old disease by and large, they're scars. And uh, these scars are healed lesions. Uh, what kills, as we've talked about many times before, I've shown you videos of, uh, about it and so on, what kills are the tiny little pimples or pustules that pop and form sudden blood clots. Well, they don't do anything about those. You have 44,000 miles of blood vessels and it's loaded with old disease which is the big blockages they see, and then it's uh, loaded with young disease, which are the pimples that pop, and they pop and they form a blood clot. That's why we call a heart attack a coronary artery thrombosis. So once you understand that mechanical picture of what goes on, then you understand why heart surgery in terms of bypassing with a vein or an artery, or, um, or angioplasty where they go in and they break up these blockages can't possibly work the other thing that uh, you learned uh, if you read the book, uh, McDougall's Med Medicine, A Challenge and Second Opinion, I gave you that chapter free, is you learned that there are a lot of complications related to this surgery. And one of the primary complications is brain damage, which is never discussed with the patient, ever. Uh, this brain damage uh, occurs as a consequence of being on the heart lung machine, which is a modern medical miracle. It really is. It's just not perfect. Uh, what happens when you're on this machine, your blood flows through the the pumps and the membranes, what happens is the blood cells get damaged and they form clumps. And these clumps, uh, they're put back into the bloodstream. Uh, bubbles of gas, they enter the uh, bloodstream through the membranes. Pieces of plastic break off of the membranes and break off of the, uh, of the tubes. And all this debris is uh, dumped back into the patient. And what happens is uh, some of the debris, a lot of the debris, is uh, big enough to take in uh, block distal vessels. And so uh, a clump of debris, blood vessels or blood cells or plastic parts or bubbles, gets uh, caught in a tiny blood vessel and what lies distal dies. And that's okay with all of the body, most of the body, because it will regrow tissue or at least it will make scar tissue that uh, is not of any great significance. But the problem is when this embolization occurs in the brain, uh, you get diffuse brain damage. And uh, it occurs 100% of the time if you measure products of injury in the spinal fluid. Uh, anybody who works in heart disease, you know about this complication. It's called a pump head or bypass brain. That's what the nurses and technicians refer to the condition uh, you know, among themselves. And 90% of people have bypass brain or pump head to the point where they're confused, they're having terrible dreams, they're having difficulty verbalizing within the 20, first 24 hours after the surgery, 90% of people are having obvious trouble. And then you send them home, say, four, five, six, seven days later, and still about half the people are having difficult. Uh, it's not like they can't deal with major things like turning on the TV. They maybe can't remember things as well, names and numbers. Or they have personality changes. Uh, these personality changes are often are often discussed with me. Well, once patients find this out, they say, you know, grandma used to read a book every day. And since her heart surgery, she doesn't read at all. You know, what's going on? Or, uh, you know, my husband used to be the nicest man in the world. Now he just blows off at the slightest thing. 
you know, he uh, gets angry with me and the children, and, and I don't understand what's happened. Uh, so you get these personality changes, these uh, memory problems, and uh, if it was discussed with a physician preoperatively, that would be nice because it's a known, accepted complication. It always happens. Uh, as far as long term, about uh, about 44% of people are still having a 20% deficit in their thinking five years later. That was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So, you know, five years later, this is obviously permanent damage. If, if preoperatively the heart surgeons, the cardiologists discuss this with the patient, and maybe also the fact that heart surgery does not save lives, I would think that would be proper informed consent. Now, there are some exceptions with an acute heart attack, uh, intervention, I mean, within 90 minutes and certainly within six, seven hours of the event, uh, intervention can make a difference both in the brain and the heart, but you've got to get it in that time frame. After that, the uh, tissue that lies distal to the occlusion in the brain, the tissue's dead, or in the heart, the tissue's dead, so it's really too late to go in and say open things up. But I think it'd be nice if uh, patients were preoperatively uh, informed of this complication, what's likely to happen, and also the, the actual risks and benefits, and they're not. I mean, that's not part of the business. And uh, I wrote this back in 1985 in the chapter that I asked you to read, and nothing's changed since then. There were 40-some years later. Nothing's changed. Uh, there are just uh, bigger hospitals and more heart surgeons and maybe fancier heart lung machines and still the same old. Same old thing. And um, that should make you upset. So the, the other bottom line that's never told to the patient, and I think these, this, this is fair. The other thing that's not told to the patient preoperatively, or when they're laying there uh, after four hours of their heart being exposed to scale operating room air, and then them being wired and sewed back together, they're laying there in the intensive care unit. The doctors come in and see how they're doing, and the patient must think, I mean, this is a teaching opportunity, a teaching opportunity. The patients, at least some of them, must be thinking, I would do anything to not be in this situation again. And they're laying there, and their doctors and nurses come in, and maybe once in a while they express themselves, and they say, Doc, I would do anything to not be here again, to avoid having more, more heart surgery or having a heart attack, I would do anything. The doc looks at the patient and looks over at the at the lunch tray and says, you know, that, that hamburger looks really good. It's got plenty of cheese and calcium in it. And you got this big wound on your chest. Uh, you, you need some extra protein. I think you better try and eat that whole hamburger. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, a teaching opportunity. The very food served to the patients are the ones that brought them there. I've said before, and I hope you'll remember me long afterwards as uh, being the one of the originators of this statement, and that is that the food service in the hospital deserves a kickback from the surgery department and the pharmacy departments of the hospital because they continue to feed them patients. Now, initially, they come there because of dietary diseases. Uh, their diet has never changed. I can go to my local hospital. You can go to yours. The same sickening foods. Uh, that gave them the cancers and the heart disease and the type 2 diabetes and so on. Same foods are being served. At the hospital I used to be at, which was kind of interesting, I, um, after I left Hawaii, I practiced there for many years. But after I left Hawaii, I took a job at St. Helena Hospital in the Napa Valley, which was known as the number two heart surgery hospital in all of California. I worked with three great heart surgeons. Uh, I didn't really, I can't remember sending them any patients, but I wouldn't be surprised if in the, the 16 years I was there taking care of more than 3,000 patients, I wouldn't be surprised if one or two of my patients did lead the services of the heart surgeons and went. They were nice men, they really were, uh, but what they did, did primarily one thing. It kept the hospital doors open. 80% of the business came from heart surgery or heart disease at uh, St. Lee and your hospital too, 80% of the business comes from this disease. So uh, we got along for 16 years and uh, they never sent me any patients. They didn't have a single patient with dietary disease in 16 years that I was at St. Lee Hospital. It was so amazing to me. 
And this was an Adventist hospital, by the way. These are people whose mission statement, their religious mission statement, is to give health to the community by good diet, including a vegetarian diet. And they could never see any value in what I did. Anyway, things have not changed. Uh, I uh, Just to kind of conclude this uh, whole discussion, maybe we can get on to some other things. This is a dietary disease. It's caused by the rich Western diet. It uh, does not exist in people who eat a starch-based diet. They found uh, no coronary artery disease in the Asians prior to World War II. Uh, if you look uh, throughout history, however, you find uh, extensive atherosclerosis in the rich people from 3,500 years ago, those being the pharaohs and the priests and priestesses that were buried in uh, buried as money, mummies and examined later on. Over half of them, or half of them, that uh, were found to have intact artery systems had uh, uh, evidence of severe atherosclerosis. These are people 3,500 years ago. So we know it causes uh, coronary artery disease, which affects the kidney. So you get kidney artery disease, which affects the brain, which gives you cerebrovascular disease. And, you know, 44,000 miles of arteries you have, and they're all affected. We know what causes it. It is the food. Yes, smoking aggravates it. What else would aggravate it? Exercise certainly does not slow it or cure it. So we know what causes it. It is a reversible disease. Uh, the bulk of the disease can be reversed. Uh, the bulk, which is what you care about. You don't care about the scars unless they're so big they're causing pain and then you, maybe you would want to have some surgery because it, the scars are so big, but that's not usually the case. So the killing part of the disease is easy to reverse by changing diet. There are some medications that uh, are of note and may be of some importance and those would be a baby aspirin a day. And sufficient statin to keep the uh, cholesterol below 150, but the diet's the fundamental thing and that's what people know. We need to know. So we know the cause, we know it's reversible, we know current therapy doesn't work, we know why it doesn't work, we know what the complications are, but the business continues for the obvious reason that it's a huge, huge moneymaker. Uh, so I, I actually read a chapter that I wrote in 1985. Nothing's changed. Uh, same statistics, that studies go over and over and prove exactly what I said. There are a lot of deniers out there, I'm not saying there aren't deniers out there, but but uh, the truth doesn't change. And then I gave you a uh, article I wrote in August 2012 about Neil Armstrong, uh, one of our great world heroes, uh, the first man on the moon. And uh, Neil Armstrong, he lived to be 82 until he went for a checkup. Perfectly well, I mean, he had no problems at all. He just went for a checkup. He went in and got his heart checked and if you read the story, I believe he had the treadmill stress test that he flunked and then the next day he was on the operating room table and as an octogenarian, 82 years old, he was at high risk of dying. The statistics are there. I put it in the article for you. So here's a man with no symptoms, enjoying life. One of the most famous men that will, that will have ever walked planet Earth and, uh, and uh, our satellite moon. <laughs> Walks into the operating room and doesn't walk out. You know, the, the heart surgeons killed him. Plain and simple, they killed him, and they knew they were going to kill him beforehand, and they knew there was no benefits, but it was just business. That's what they're trained to do. And so I wrote that article, and I believe it was Cincinnati that this all occurred in. And I still, I'm still waiting for a response. I wrote it in August 2012. I accused these heart surgeons of killing Neil Armstrong. <clears throat> well, they're not going to say anything because it's true. Anyway, and then I, I gave you an update in my May 2016 newsletter, again, just to show you things aren't changing. I uh, explained to you that most of us have chronic coronary artery disease. I told you under under the age of 40, if your cholesterol is in the uh, 300 range, you have a 91% chance of having blocked arteries. If you have your cholesterol is normal and you're under 40, say your cholesterol is 200, you have about 20% chance of blocked arteries. I'm talking about 50% or greater closure. As you get older, because you continue to eat the artery damaged Western diet, what happens is the frequency of this disease becomes more common. All these charts are in there for you to read. Somebody my age and nearly 70, I have a 91% chance of having uh, moderate to severe. And these were severe blockages described. So uh, you've got coronary artery disease, just plan on it. Uh, they've got treatments and if they discover it, they're gonna treat it. Uh, very few people need this heart surgery, very, very few. And uh, 
a lot of people get it and they brag about it. They say, look, 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 I got five. How many did you get? I don't know that men do that much anymore, but that used to be a big deal. How many did you get? I got five. <laughs> so that's, uh, that, those are the, the uh, articles I asked you to read. Uh, you will find uh, no disagreement in terms of science as to what I told you. Uh, if you sit down with your favorite family doctor or cardiologist or heart surgeon and you ask them to read what I wrote in 1985, uh, the only thing they might fault me for was I was a little too kind to the heart surgeons. Yeah, I was probably, I gave them a little bit more credit than they deserve, but just maybe a tiny percent more because it's really worse than I even knew back then. Uh, they will tell you that everything Dr. McDougall says is true and scientifically documented, and then they'll go back to work <laughs> and uh, do their job. So, uh, and I've got you interested in artery disease. Uh, I've got you uh, feeling in control. You are not doomed. Even with a family history, you are not doomed. Uh, you could fix this uh, with uh, strict adherence to a healthy diet and uh, judicious use of medications. Right. Well, thank you. That was a really good overview, Dr. McDougall. And I do have some... Um, questions that some people have submitted ahead of time so right. to be respectful to them i'll do this first and then i'll go through some of the questions that we have here in the chat and one of the questions is about you know food and this person is saying if you already have heart disease should olives and avocados and other high plant high fat plant food be excluded from your diet i i would say uh to be on the cautious side you should do it uh, Dr. Esselstyn is very strong about the idea of not eating these high-fat plant foods. Uh, I don't, I don't feel as, uh, that strongly about it. Um, certainly, if you're overweight, you you must limit these high-fat plant foods. Say you're a trim guy. Well, you know, this is a good question. I, I don't really have the whole answer for you. You're going to ask ask of me, and I just don't have the the data to confirm. And that's why I ask you to err on the side of caution. But uh, I've shown you the uh, blood sludging slides that were done by Dr. Swank and then done in humans by Peter Kuo and Dr. Williams, uh, how the blood sludges when you feed people 67% of the calories is fat. And that was from animal foods. And I showed how it happens with vegetable oil also. But the question, a good question to be answered is, well, what if somebody decided uh, that they were going to go and just eat nuts and seeds and avocados. And so their diet was 90% fat. Would the blood sludge? My guess is it would, but I don't know that. Just like it does with 67% of the calories as butter and, and, uh, as, and meat and eggs and so on. Uh, it certainly does in real foods there. So I, I would think it'd be reasonable to assume that if you encourage that much fat intake, that your blood cells are not going to do well and that you will get blood sludging. As far as damage to the artery walls, again, I would, I would uh, err on the caution side. Now, we run into a situation where somebody has had closed artery scars. You know, they're in good health. They've been eating well for a year or two, and they're starting to get quite thin, which mm -hmm. can happen. And then the right. question is, well, should, what should they add next? I think next would be dry fruits. Maybe more breads, uh, refined grains would be the next safest step to do to get more calories in with least damage. And then the last thing I would recommend, and this is discussed, I believe, in my July 2003 newsletter. The last thing I would recommend is people going to nuts and seeds and avocados to keep their weight on. Right, right. So that may not have been as, uh, as satisfactory as an answer as, uh, uh, as you'd like to have had, but, you know, that's what I know. That's all I know. Right. And what about what would happen with someone that doesn't have heart disease and would would saturated fats like the one in in avocados and nuts uh, be a problem for the health of the like endothelial cells and would it contribute yeah. to heart disease? Yeah, I, I again I don't know, uh, but these things are I think healthy. So um, if the question were. Say you started as a uh, young person, clean arteries, as we all do, they start to get clogged up about eight months of age. And then all the kids on the American diet have evidence of atherosclerosis by age two. 
But uh, say, for example, you had been raised in pre-World War II Japan, and you lived on a diet of almost all rice and vegetables and very little animal foods, and uh, you lived a lifetime with clean arteries. And by the way, they had clean arteries. Uh, would if you were, say, the prince in Japan, or the princess, and you had uh, opportunities to eat unlimited nuts and seeds, what would happen to your arteries? Uh, nobody knows. Uh, I would guess you'd get fat, but whether or not you develop artery disease is an unknown. You can only speculate. Uh, I do know that these are rich. I also know that they're healthy. So I think that Gustavo, other than making things up for people, I think that's the best I can say. It's never been tested. Um, so uh, treat them as rich foods. Not right. seeds and avocados. So they were made by they were made by God. Mm-hmm. Uh, put in proper packages, like <laughs> proper packages, right? That's the that is it. Uh, uh, Doctor McDougall, when I was at the um, uh, advanced study weekend, one of the lectures was entirely devoted to atrial fibrillation, and a lot of people here are asking Mandrola. if we would say something about that. Well, it was Doctor Mandrola who was the speaker, who's a yes. you know, specialist in atrial fib, and I had no idea. Just like. You know, when I plan these advanced study weekends, I pick people that I think I would enjoy hearing. And mm-hmm. it would be beneficial. I had no, no idea what John Mandrola was going to say. Uh, somehow or another, I did get some, uh, some writing about him in the past that encouraged me to invite him. And, you know, he came uh, at, at not a small price tag. You think all these people uh, come out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, they don't. Uh, Mary and I pay them very well to come. Yes. And so he came to the, to the uh, event. And he wasn't as diet oriented as he would like to have been. He actually asked me some very important questions that indicated that he wanted to learn more about diet and heart disease. So I shared with my actually gave him a copy of the Starch Solution and uh, the healthiest diet on the planet. But what he did help me with, uh, me personally and Dr. Lim, uh, is he helped us understand a little bit better on how we should treat people with atrial fib. And my takeaway was that ablation, which is the new rage, uh, is uh, has uh, a lot of limitations. Uh, that's what I got from him, and he does ablation, right? If I re- recall correctly, you're asking me to remember something that happened almost a month ago. And the other uh, the other thing that I got from his lecture was that uh, uh, fewer people than are presently treated need to be treated with uh, anti clotting drugs like Seralta, Pradaxa. Uh, we used to treat them with warfarin or coumadin. It was called rat poison. And I was switched over to these uh, other type of, uh, of clot preventing drugs, which have uh, become all the rage, not, not, a, not, with a, not for no good reason. I mean, these things are very expensive and warfarin coumadin is very cheap. And uh, they result in bleeding. The problem is, is that you can't reverse the bleeding. They tell me now they have a new way of reversing the bleeding, but with COVID, we just gave vitamin K and it was reversed easily when people got into life threatening bleeds. So one of the limitations has been bleeding. Uh, there was just an article published in JAMA. I read, I read so many journals, but it showed a difference between Pradaxa and, uh, Zeralto in terms of bleeding risks. I mean, it's huge. Uh, so there is a difference as to which of these drugs you do choose. But anyway, Mandrola kind of made me feel a lot better about not putting my patients on anything to prevent blood clots Mm -hmm. from forming in the heart, which is a a small risk for stroke occurring when these blood clots form. So that's what I got out of his lecture. Uh, We're not gonna put his lecture up publicly. Uh, You can can still watch it. You can sign up for the weekend. Right, you can be be people, you can watch actually that lecture. Yeah, you can watch the whole lecture. Uh, I did do a, a short, uh, interview with him, private interview, which we will be mm-hmm. putting up sometime in the future. And uh, I bet I asked him some pretty pointed questions in that interview. So it's available. You can also look up on the internet, uh, John Mandrola, M-A-N-D-R-O-L-A-M-D. And you can see what he writes. Uh, I, I was extremely impressed with this man mm-hmm. and what he knew and also his eagerness to learn more. It was, it was a good a good lecture. Yeah, yeah, it was very good. I- Enjoyed it. And I think, was it he that talked about um, not using uh, or prescribing aspirin, or was it somebody else? Yes, he did. He was actually, you know, one of the things that we do, we, including me, 
when we're taking care of, and we're all trained this way. Uh, you don't want to you you don't want the patient to do poorly or die without having a bag full of drugs next to their bed, because you look bad as a doctor. You look very bad, and uh, so what uh, Dr. Lim, myself, and then many other doctors do because we don't want to prescribe these very powerful uh, blood clot preventing drugs like Coumadin or Xeralto now or Pravaxa. You know we don't want to we don't you know we're afraid for the patient. But we're also afraid that uh, we ought to do something. And what I have commonly done in the past, and uh, most doctors do when they don't put them on powerful blood clot preventing drugs, is we put them on uh, aspirin with the idea, well, at least we're doing something. But what Dr. Mandrola said is uh, we may be doing more harm than good. And there's certainly not sufficient evidence that aspirin is going to, uh, going to take the place of, say, Coumadin when it's necessary. So yeah, I, I got an awful lot out of that man's lecture. I'd like to learn a lot more from him. Right, right. Dr. Manjolo, there's a topic, of course, that always comes up when we talk about heart and it's, it's high cholesterol. But uh, yeah. my question is, or has evolved into this, uh, if, if a person's arteries are really healthy, and, and um, uh, th does it really matter that much, well, how, how high the cholesterol, I mean, of course, if the cholesterol, I don't know, is 600, yeah. uh, but how much does it matter if the arteries are in good condition? Perfectly clean, yeah. Well, this is, a, this, again, it's an important question that I can't give you a definitive answer. I have seen many women in my practice over the last uh, 40 years that have had cholesterols over 300, and we've studied their arteries with, say, uh, uh, heart scans, and we found their arteries perfectly clean. I can also think of one man that I took care of that had a very high cholesterol. We scanned his arteries and they're perfectly clean. There is an association, and it has some causal relationships here too. There's an association between the cholesterol in your blood and the health of your arteries. And I showed that back in the book in uh, called mm -hmm. 1985, McDougall's Medicine. And that's a, a, a strong correlation that we've known about. But you have to take, like with so many things, you have to take one step back and go to a common denominator. And that common denominator is the food. The food, which happens to be high in cholesterol because cholesterol is primarily in animal products. The food causes the blood cholesterol to go up and the food also causes uh, the, the arteries to be damaged. So it's really the food. And there are many components of the food that cause this. Uh, for example, uh, different mechanisms have been proposed and are true, such as uh, the oxidized cholesterol, which means it has mm -hmm. an extra electron. And the oxidized cholesterol actually causes uh, direct damage to the lining of the blood vessels called the intima. And then another theory that got a lot of attention, which I believe is true also, is that trimethylamine, trimethylamine, TMA, which comes from carnitine, which is meat, and um, and another meat substance. Anyway, uh, trimethylamine, when it's ingested, uh, is not not absorbed easily in the body in vegetarians. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but in meat eaters, you grow a kind of bacteria in your gut that converts trimethylamine to trimethylamine oxide which is quite toxic, which is easily absorbed into the body and which damages the arteries. So all that work, I believe, was done at Cleveland Clinic. Yes. So there's another mechanism that involves eggs and cheese and meat, the trimethylamine conversion to trimethylamine oxide, which takes place by the bacteria in meat eaters. So mm -hmm. if you're a vegan, you don't get that conversion. Uh, Anyway, the, let me get back to your question. Uh, the, the question is, is the relationship between blood cholesterol and your risk of coronary artery disease. It's due to a common denominator, which is the food. And people who have higher cholesterols generally eat worse or have, a, have less efficient uh, metabolism to deal with that cholesterol. See, cholesterol, cholesterol is made by all animals. And we have to make 500 milligrams a day, about 500 milligrams a day. And we have a liver that can detoxify and excrete into the bile acids and into the bowel about 500 milligrams a day. That's our capacity of our liver. Now, 
early scientists, when they studied the effect of cholesterol on artery disease, they found that you could make that, you could uh, make artery disease, in fact, you could only make it in animals by feeding them cholesterol. Uh, that was a, uh, one of the primary ingredients in causing atherosclerosis in animals, and they could do that in guinea pigs and in rabbits, uh, but they couldn't do it in dogs or cats. They could feed them just loads of egg yolks, and they would never develop atherosclerosis. And the reason is, is because a dog and a cat have a liver which has the capacity to crank up when they eat their typical diet of dogs and cats, dogs being omnivores, cats being carnivores. The liver cranks up and uh, increases its ability to metabolize cholesterol and to make it feed the body. Now, in rabbits and in uh, guinea pigs and in human beings, our liver has a limited capacity to crank up and get rid of that cholesterol. So if it can't be uh, ridden from the body by being excreted in the bowels and it stays in the bloodstream, where does it go? Well, it gets under your skin, say, uh, under, under your eyes and calls, it causes uh, white streaks called xanthelasma, I believe it is. It gets in the tendons of the uh, of the muscles and causes uh, xanthomas, which are cholesterol tumors in your tendons. It gets so it gets in your skin and your tendon and your tendons, and it also gets in your artery walls. All right, all right. So let me get to the bottom line joke of this whole thing. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, well, that's just unfair. Dogs and cats they have a liver that can upregulate uh, and get rid of the cholesterol. That's not fair. We should have livers like dogs and cats, they're saying. We should, if we're going to go to Arby's and McDonald's, then we should have a liver like a dog and a cat. We got cheated. No, what you ought to be thinking is your liver's just fine. You're just fine. You're just, you shouldn't be eating like a dog and a cat. Uh, there's nothing wrong with our livers. Uh, that's just no. we're, eating, uh, we're eating a diet that uh, right. exceeds the capacity of the liver to excrete the cholesterol. So anyway, there is an association, but it's uh, one step back. And that's why statin drugs do not work well. It's very difficult to show benefits in terms of preventing the first heart attack or the second heart attack, particularly the first heart attack called primary prevention. It's very difficult to see that benefit in terms of, uh, of lives saved or heart attacks prevented. You can review my May 2013 newsletter about statin drugs. There's a great discussion by John Abraham, one of our advanced study weekend instructors. And you'll just see how seldom it is that a heart attack is prevented by lowering cholesterol using statin drugs. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the reason is, is the pro problem is not statin deficiency. And if you just lower one sign of bad eating, like right. cholesterol, you still haven't stopped the bad eating. Uh, you can, uh, you know, there are all kinds of different drugs that will change the risk factors, like lower the blood pressure with blood pressure pills. You can lower triglycerides mm -hmm. with uh, fish oil or uh, clofibrate. Now, we have drugs that can you know, lower that. We, we can lower your blood sugar, which is associated with more heart attacks, by taking pills or insulin. But the, the truth is, is when you do that aggressively, if you increase the risk of heart attacks and death. We've talked about that, aggressive treatment, diabetes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can change numbers. I mean, as a doctor, I have the ability to change numbers dramatically, but I can't fix the problem uh, by giving you a bunch of drugs. The problem is the food. It's like taking a, a heavy cigarette smoker and giving them codeine so they won't cough. Now, what have you done? You've taken care of one sign of lung damage. They don't cough as much, or maybe you can give them some antibiotics once in a while and stop the mucus mm -hmm. from being so yellow. But you haven't solved the problem by changing signs of disease. Now, why do doctors treat signs like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, high uric acid, high blood sugar? Because we can. Because you can. see, we have drugs. We have drugs to do that. We can treat signs, and we can just make a gazillions of dollars off of the, this kind of oh, attitude, yeah, which is yeah. to do. So why don't we treat the problem, which is the food? Well. We can't. As doctors, we're paralyzed because we do not get any of this education right. in medical school. We've talked about the law that I, well, let's just say I created and got passed in 2011, SB 380, which forces doctors to learn about nutrition. That was 2011, where we five years later, September 2011, mm -hmm. Governor Jerry Brown signed it into law. So we're 
five years and one month later, and still not one of the 11 medical schools teaches a meaningful class in California on nutrition. So you learn nothing about it. So you say to yourself as a learning doctor, it must not be important or they teach it to me. Right. I, exactly. just spent a half, I just spent a half a million dollars, which is what they did, getting an education and they didn't teach anything about nutrition, so it can't be important. I mean, why would I make such a stupid investment of a half a million dollars to take uh, training that uh, that was uh, un was not meaningful or useful. Well, you mm -hmm. did because it was about nutrition. And then doctors can't take care of the basic problem because they have no uh, they have no reward for doing so. Right. Right. There's just, there's just no financial reward. There uh, there's no impractical reward. You want people coming to your office. Even if you didn't get paid, you'd want to have something to do. You have to see patients, and so. If you got them well, they'd never come. They'd never come. You'd, you'd have no patience. <laughs> right. Forget the money. You'd, you'd have nobody to talk to during the day. Uh, so there's really no motivation to do the right thing, which is to deal with the cause. And once you, in fact, let me just take a minute to take you back to my graduation day from my internal medicine residency. I was called in, and I've been called in many times during my medicine residency because I was bad. Uh, because I talk about things that real doctors didn't talk about. And believe me, uh, continuing education for me was at risk all the time. You know, I was almost thrown out of medical school on at least two occasions. And the same thing with residency. I was all, almost thrown out of my residency on two occasions. The two in residency had to do with food. The two in medical school was just because of my personality. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, the day of graduation, my chief of medicine, Irv Schatz, his name was Irv Schatz. Nice man, protruding belly. Irv Schatz calls me in, one of many visits, and he says to me, John, remember, I've got my certificate in my hand. Uh, I'm a board, I'm an, uh, I'm an internal medicine specialist. I don't know whether I was board, board certified at that time or not, but I am. Beyond his touch. So I went in with a, a new attitude. One I had before is you just got to bite your lip, John, and get through this. But I went in there and he said to me, he says, Irv Schott said to me, he says, you know, I like you, John. I like Mary. I love your two kids. And that's why I'm having this conversation with you. I I'm really concerned that you're going to starve to death with your crazy ideas about being a vegetarian or a vegan. All you're going to do is collect a bunch of bums and hippies. That's what Irv told me, and I paused for a minute and gave it some thought, and I said, well, you know, Dr. Schott, maybe I was calling him Irv by that day because I had my ticket. <laughs> but I said, Irv, I think you're wrong. And even if you're right, you know, I've got to do what I know to be true. I know what the research says about the drugs and surgeries that you're asking me to administer to my, my customers, and I can't do it with clear consciousness. And I'm not talking about all the surgeries and all the drugs, but the bulk of them. And then I said to him, you know, he was right. I said to him, in a way he was right. I said to him, I think you're wrong as I pointed toward his prospering abdomen. I said to him, I don't think it's going to be bums and hippies that I collect. I said, I think it's going to be successful people, successful people who've worked hard to get an education, to build businesses, to get great family relationships, to find perfect mates, to raise wonderful children. They're going to be hardworking people who get a bang out of life, successful people. And what's going to happen along the way is they're going to say to themselves, look at me. I'm such a big success. How come I'm so fat? How come I got to take this bag full of pills? And I said to Irv, let's just say I called him Irv. <laughs> I probably didn't. I probably called him Dr. Schatz. I said, Irv, when these people are there asking that question, I'm going to be there with this answer. Because you can be successful. All you got to do is you just got to change your diet. Put, put a tenth of, a month of the amount of work you took getting your, uh, your college degree and put it into solving your health problems at the dinner table. But let me just give you the real end of the story. <clears throat> What Irv Schatz was telling me, which gets back to why do people treat heart disease, like why do they treat the signs of heart disease with Lipitor and blood pressure pills and so on, is what Irv Schatz was trying to tell me is that, John, here you're a board-certified internist. You've got two kids, one more to be on the way. 
you, you haven't learned to play the game, John. You know, this is how we play the game when it comes to general medicine. Is what we do is we take a flock, a school, uh, uh, you know, we take a herd of patients, say 500 or 1,000 of them. We take them, we get them hooked on drugs, blood pressure pills, statins, diabetic pills, and we make them come back uh, every month to get their refills or every couple of months. And once you get these 500,000 people hooked on drugs, on your care, then you can just, you know, uh, change the cash register every time they walk in. And that's what you do. That's what doctors do in their seven-minute offices with their patients is they just, you know, change the cash register. And I wasn't playing that way. You know, I, I plain and simple uh, uh, had set up a practice where I hope to get no return visits. Now, I told you I was going to end, but I do remember one more part of this story. And that was, I worked at Honolulu Medical Group back in um, probably the later 80s, uh, early 90s. It's still a medical group in Honolulu. I worked at the Honolulu Medical Group. I was actually, you know, part of the, I was respectable for those moments. And uh, it was an interesting setting, the medical group. We all worked in this long hallway. So we interacted with each other and the nurses and the doctors. We had our own side rooms, but it was one big hallway. So you could really hear what was going on. And uh, I was witnessing one conversation. The nurse said, uh, Mrs. McGillicuddy, she's on the phone. She's got to go to a funeral. She can't come in to get her uh, blood pressure pills and diabetic pills refilled. Can we do it over the phone? And the doctor said, no. You tell her to get in here. Now, Mrs. McGillicuddy had been on these pills for the last 10 years. Why couldn't she just get a refill over the phone? It's because you can't charge for a refill over the phone. And so uh, this confirmed for me what Irv had told me, Dr. Schott, is you've got to get a collection of patients and you must ding them. Now I think it's every three months, but we used to ding them every month uh, for refills of their uh, medications and they come in and get their blood pressure checked. Um, nowadays, I think it's nurse practitioners and other people. So the doctor even has to spend less personal time doing it, but that's the way the business is set up. So why do we treat cholesterol with statins? Why don't we tell people what the problem is and how to solve it? Well, it's just not part of the business plan. And doctors know no, they know no different. It's not like your doctor's actively out there trying to fail your future. It's just that you're, you know, it's that your doctor knows nothing. Would you just say a few words about some people think that perhaps exercise plays a big role in reversing heart disease? Can you just name, say something about that? Well, I can, I can give you some gravestones like Jim Fix. Is the uh, the father of running, died at 56 of a massive coronary. His dad died of coronary artery disease. And there was a guy, Jack Scaff. Uh, and not many people I don't get along with, but Jack Scaff, who was a cardiologist in, in Honolulu and promoted the marathons along with Jim Fix. And they used to say in the 1970s and 80s and maybe even into the 90s that if you could run a marathon, you'd never die of a heart attack. Well, the graveyards are filled with people who run marathons who died of heart attack. This is completely untrue. Uh, you know, their own personal histories show it. I under understand I haven't seen Jack Scaff in many years, but I understand he's still alive, but barely. And he's my age. So uh, it's not true. Exercise will not prevent you from getting atherosclerosis or dying of a heart attack. It uh, has uh, very little influence. So the association would be that those who are, pay attention to exercise are mo more likely to not smoke, which is a contributory factor to damaging the arteries, and they're probably more diet conscious. So that's where any benefit comes from, is the fact that these are just more uh, self-conscious people about good habits. Right. Right. Dr. Doug Lyle is going to be on next week, isn't he? Yes, next week is Dr. Lyle. He's going to be doing a Q&A question. So. Um, That'll be good. But I, yes. uh, my last newsletter was about the sugar feed cancer, and that, that would have been a good, long discussion. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Right. Now we start. Yeah, we run a couple cool. of programs. Run a couple of programs this month uh, for big businesses. We 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 take on the uh, sick employees of a couple of large businesses because 
make some money. I mean, the guy who writes the check, he's figured mm-hmm. out, you can't go to the health, health resource people. They don't write the check. <laughs> but if you go to the guy who writes the check or the gal who writes the check, uh, they go, well, let's see, I can cut my medical care costs by 40% by doing this. Right. Which we proved right. when we took care of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, employees back in the year 2000. You could cut your health care costs by 44%. So anyways, we have two large uh, companies that are bringing in their employees mm-hmm. over the next couple of months. And I think our next 10-day uh, open to the public is in December. Right. Uh, right. Maybe December 2nd. You can find that on the website. I'll be putting out a newsletter every month. We'll be doing a webinar, you and I. And yes, every Thursday. And Lyle and whoever else we can talk into it. <laughs> and then uh, Mary's still got a couple rooms for Kauai. You're going to be in Kauai. So if you want to come to Kauai with us, uh, and when I say she still has a couple of rooms, believe me, ladies and gentlemen, she still has a couple of rooms, and that's it. She can't get any more. She's begged and done everything she could to get more rooms for our I Kauai think adventure. I think we, you've taken over the whole <laughs> the whole hotel. Oh, oh we have we have a good, a good share. We, we have a nice sized group of people, and Mary nice. and I are going to be there. And so is Heather and Brant, our children and children-in-law, yes. and we'll have our three grandkids there. They're going to take off school. We've got other kids going, too. I guess we have maybe four to six other young kids going and taking off school. Let's have a good time. Uh, we will see we'll, you in two weeks then, hopefully. Yeah, we'll find something to talk about in a couple of weeks. Enjoy Dr. Lyle next week. I know you always do. Yes, we have all the webinars ready on your website for people to register. So it's everything is there. Good. Good. All right. Well, very good. Uh, I will see you then. Yes, I will see you then. And in the meantime, all all be well. If it's the food, all be well. <laughs> stuff, it's the food. Thank you very much. Well, for, for those people that, I know this is a long webinar, but those people who want to stay a little bit longer, I'm just going to show you what I'm going to eat today for lunch, if you oh, yeah. care. I, you know, yeah. it's, I'm going to watch. I'm going to take myself offline, okay? All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Very good. We'll see what you're going to have today. All right. I will be... Um, I'll be back in one minute so I can move the camera and I'll just show you what I have here for me today. All right, everybody. I'm here in my kitchen and uh, I just, some of you ask if I would show what I make or what I eat. And oops, I'm sorry about that. Uh, And so I'm just going to show you what I'm going to have today. And I'm also going to show you something that I make really fast that I like, and um, so today what I have um, right after we finish this webinar is I found that the store some artichokes. These were huge artichokes, and I put the um, artichokes inside the Instant Pot that I got. I'm excited that I have the new Instant Pot, and it is the, 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 the bigger size, and so I put the artichokes there for like five minutes and it was perfect and I also have steamed broccoli so steamed broccoli artichokes uh, on the broccoli I, I instead of putting salt I put lemon and uh, I will probably put lemon on the artichokes too and sometimes I may put pepper or maybe another another condiment but that's probably going to do it and then of course this is not going to last more than maybe 45 minutes i'll be hungry and it's not enough starch so i have my um um sweet potatoes these are all i i i'm buying now the smaller size because i use them like candy bar in the afternoon sometimes i am teaching way too many hours in a row and I get a little bit of, a, um, you know, just just just, uh, just hungry, and I want something sweet. So, mm. these are really so sweet. Sometimes, almost too sweet. So, I'm sorry, I'm hungry. Um, so I, I bake always a, a lot I, as many as i can and i keep them in the refrigerator and mm, so today is this with the broccoli 
Let me just taste one broccoli here. The lemon is great. And with the artichoke. Mm. Very good. Perfect lunch. I had it already made. I always make way more than I eat in one sitting so that I can have it uh, and just warm it up in one minute and eat it. So what I thought I would show you what to do is a mixture that I put together and I put that mixture on top of rice, on top of potatoes, on top of um, beans, on top of pasta, although I, I don't eat pasta uh, too, too much. But um, it's a great um, little recipe that I have that I made for Chef AJ when she came this weekend and stayed with me. And she really, really liked it. So I inclu we included it in the webinar that we made that is going to be aired later. So this is what I do. So I'm going to move this computer here. I have a pan that is already hot. This is my pan pan, which I love, and I chopped an onion. This is a big onion, so it's already chopped, and I put it here. I have some red onion that I have left, out, left over from the webinar that I did with Chef AJ, and so I'm just going to throw it in there as well and uh, it makes the same noise it makes the same sound that it makes as if i was frying with oil but of course there is no oil because the pan is really hot and i also chopped three garlic cloves i'm going to put that a little bit later because they tend to burn so i will first let this cook a little. Because it's a scan pan, it doesn't need uh, much water or anything, but later on I will add a little bit. The other thing I add to this in just a few minutes is I add some um, mushrooms that I have chopped. Sometimes I add them whole, but uh, if you don't like mushrooms, you can also use eggplants. Eggplants is a great substitute. But these mushrooms, when they're chopped like that, uh, you cannot even tell they're mushrooms because they um, they blend so well. So now it's important that you put something green there, at least for me. So I have sometimes I have chard and sometimes I have spinach, and today I have kale. So it looks like a lot, but it really isn't. So what I'm doing, if you can see it here, I have the instant pot and I am going to put two cups of water. I just put this whole thing there. I don't take the stems out or anything. And I will put the lid on the instant pot it locks, then here on manual. And that's probably right. I, I'm just gonna set it to three minutes, not more than that. And then of course you want to lock this. It beeps when it says that that's what you want. Uh, I also have this garlic cilantro balsamic vinegar, which is amazing and I put it on top of my broccoli. This is just too, almost too good to be true. And I got this this weekend at the Engine 2 Fork, Forks Over Knives event. It's the uh, BNP. You can order them online, I think. So I'm gonna have to, to have one of these. Yeah. Um, so going back to so what I'm going to do then, I put the kale here so that it gets softer. And when it's done in about three minutes, um, well, it'd be more like five because it has to gather the pressure. Then I chop it a little bit and I add it to that mixture that it has the 
onion, the garlic, and the mushrooms. And like I said, it depends on what I'm looking for. If I want an Italian taste, then I will add some Italian herbs. See, I don't even have to add water to this. It's browning beautifully, and I still haven't put a drop of water. But just so that you hear the sound that it makes, let's see if I have some water here. Now I'm going to put the garlic in that. And let it cook for a little bit. The garlic cook, cooks quickly. So now comes the mushrooms. Again, it looks like a lot, but it does uh, condense. So it, it will be much less. The mushroom has, the mushrooms have a lot of um, liquid. So they will start releasing the liquid and this will turn out to be less than what you see here. I do let it cook quite a while, maybe uh, 15 minutes and I do, you know, come back and I just move it around. And in the meantime, the kale is cooking and I will add it to this chopped. And let's see, today what I'm gonna add is I want to add some smoked paprika. And I think I'm gonna add a little bit of turmeric. The other thing that I do sometimes is I add a little, some like a cup of um, like some spaghetti sauce that is compliant, that doesn't have fat and that doesn't have sugar and, or just plain salsa. You can just buy any kind of salsa again that doesn't have any added fat or salt or sugar. And I add it and that makes it taste really good. So I keep this in the refrigerator and I add it, like I said, add it on top of different things. I add it on top of potato, a baked potato. I add that on top of sweet potatoes. I add it on top of brown rice. If I happen to have, um, pasta, then I can add it on pasta, I can, or I can eat it by itself. But I always try to have some starch to go with it. So that's it. I don't want to make this too long. This is going to cook, like I said, for another 15 minutes or so. Then the, um, the, the uh, kale is going to be ready here. I'll get it out, squeeze it a little bit, the juice out, and I'll chop it and put it there, cook it for another 10 minutes or so. And um, that's going to be for tonight when I get home and I, don't have, I won't have anything else here and I will probably put it on one of these. I'll have this cooking and it'll be a baked potato and I'll eat it with a baked potato. So kind of boring, but I'm used to it now. I don't need a lot of variety and oh, one thing, I have had a lot of emails of people asking if, if I have a CD. I do, I just don't promote it the, probably the way I should. But if you want to listen to it for free, um, I'll just show you really quick before I leave. If you go to this website, it's called CD Baby, uh, cdbaby.com. If you go to that site uh, and you type greetings from Argentina, my CD appears first, I believe. Okay. Yeah, right there. So you click on that and you can actually you can click on each track and it'll at least show you about a minute or a minute and a half of each. Of course, you can download it here or you can buy the actual CD. Um, you know, um, they will ship it to you. If you go to the Dallas Music Academy website, then I guess I could um, 
I could sign it for you. <laughs> I could autograph it, but let's stop sharing that. Okay, so that was that, and I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to keep you in much longer here, but I'll just quickly show you one more thing. If you go to this website here, this is the Dallas Music Academy, and you go to store, I actually think that this is cheaper. <laughs> so it takes you here. And actually, it is cheaper, it's $15. And if you order it from here, I can probably unwrap the CD and sign it for you and mail it. OK, so that's it for anyone who is interested in listening to some of the music tangos from Argentina. So I will see you next week, hopefully, with Dr. Lyle. And uh, have a great week and a great weekend. I hope to go to the Texas state fair this weekend and um, of course there's nothing to eat there everything is fried so i'm gonna have to take my food okay goodbye everyone it's a pleasure seeing you all and hearing your lovely comments here bye-bye